Hello, my name is Andrew Harvey, and today I'd like to talk about language documentation, specifically language documentation from a context that I know well, namely the Tanzanian Rift Valley. By focusing on this area, I hope to present a few well-situated case studies to add to a wider and ongoing conversation about ways in which language documentation is changing, and about ways in which language documentation is changing or needs to change in response to the social and indeed empirical realities of the African linguistic milieu. Uh, inevitably, someone will have said this more articulately than I just did. Uh, Ameka and Turkarafi do just that by posing the hypothetical question, what would linguistics look like had it been based on African language practices and data? Uh, for this talk, I would like to modify this useful question to something like, what must documentary linguistics come to look like if it is to be in service of African language practices and data? This is a photo taken during the language workshop held in Babati, Tanzania last year, organized by Richard Griscom, Rachel Linfield, and I. I've included a reference to the associated report at the end of the talk. Some of the topics addressed uh, desired outcomes of current documentary projects taking place in the region, as well as ways to build solidarity both among speech communities as well as between local speech communities and foreign linguists. This particular image is one of the local attendees, himself a member of the Azamjeg Datoga speaker community, giving a talk on how to conduct audiovisual documentation using a smartphone. Indeed, much of Richard and I's work now centers around building the capacity of local speaker communities to document their own languages. I've included this photo in this talk because it represents a kind of beginning of addressing the question I raised in the last slide, in which I'll uh, repeat again. What must documentary linguistics come to look like if it is to be in service of African language practices and data? The concept of language documentation, a discipline developed primarily in the West and by Western thinkers, is experiencing a radical change in both theory and practice across the African continent. With a focus on the Tanzanian Rift Valley area, this talk examines how language documentation in Africa is strongest when it takes into account the performativeness at the core of communicative practices. Two has met with general failure when serving agendas of text-based maintenance and revitalization, and three, shows great promise when it seeks to work within and strengthen traditions of orality. I'll start by situating myself in the larger topic. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the Leiden University Center for Linguistics, and the title of my current funded project is Gorwa, Hadza, and Ihanzu, Grammatical Inquiries in the Tanzanian Rift Valley Area. My interests include the languages of the Tanzanian Rift, their documentation and description, their formal morphosyntax, and the histories and cultures of their speaker communities, especially as evinced through linguistic arts and language contact. Uh, I began working with Gorwa, a South Cushitic language spoken in the area in 2012. Uh, I've been working with Ihanzu, a Bantu language spoken in the area since 2017, and this year, I begin work on Hadza as part of the previously mentioned project. Hadza is a language isolate, but still part of the larger linguistic area. And this map, designed by Carla Butz uh, in Kiesling, Mouse, and Nurse 2008, provides an approximation of the locations of the languages of the Tanzanian Rift Valley area. For a long time, this area has been seen as a unique uh, area on the African continent in that three of the major African language phyla are in contact here and have been over a long period of time. Uh, the Bantu languages of the larger Niger-Congo phylum are represented by Mbugwe, Rangi, Ihanzu, Nyilamba, and Nyaturu. Uh, the Cushitic languages of the larger Afroasiatic phylum are represented by Gorwa, Irak, Alagua and Burungay, and the southern Nilotic languages of the larger Nilo-Saharan phylum are represented by the Datoga varieties. Sandawe is said to share some affinity with the so-called Khoisan group of languages, and Hadza is best considered a language isolate, unrelated to any other language spoken today.
In addition, there are at least two known Dorobo languages, such as Omayo in the northwest of Lake Yasi and Asakh on the Maasai Steppe, which are, or at least were, spoken by small groups of people entirely surrounded by others. The affiliation of these languages, uh, especially Asakh, is possibly Cushitic, but because they are no longer spoken, this question will most likely remain unanswered. In addition to a diversity of language families, speaker communities exhibit a great diversity of faiths, kinship patterns, and social structures. So, using subsistence models as one measure, the Ihanzu and the Mbugwe are, for example, sedentary farmers, whereas the Datoga people are still largely pastoralists. The Hadza people practice a hunter-gatherer mode of subsistence, and a host of other patterns may also be seen. So, for example, uh, the Gorwa and Iraq people are effectively sedentary farmers, but prefer to see themselves as pastoralists, whereas the Sandawe at some earlier point hunted and gathered, uh, but the majority are now sedentary farmers. And alongside linguistic and cultural diversity, the dynamics of each of the languages of the Rift Valley are also diverse. So the Dorobo languages are, as previously mentioned, virtually extinct. And though the number of people who speak the Hadza language is historically high, encroachment on their traditional land, as well as uh, problems facing their way of life, mean that the language faces an existential threat to remain spoken into the future. Meanwhile, Alagua is being rapidly replaced by Rangi, uh, and similarly, Gorwa speakers more and more prefer to identify themselves as Iraq or Mbulu. Uh, what this means for the Gorwa language is yet to be seen, uh, and Ihanzu is steadily being assimilated by Nyilamba. Sandawe, on the other hand, has been surprisingly stable, and uh, though Helen Neaton notes a steady erosion of traditional stories and cultural aspects, she also notes that the Sandawe language is under no immediate threat of endangerment. And Yaturu, with nearly one million speakers, is one of the largest languages in the country. So, while many of the languages of the Tanzanian Rift Valley area can be seen as losing speakers, not all of them are. On the other hand, however, and most relevant to our current talk, all of the languages of the Tanzanian Rift Valley area can be described as either undocumented or underdocumented. That is, despite these languages being theoretically interesting and crucibles of rich cultural heritage, and despite a subset of them facing the prospect of no longer being spoken in their future, none of these languages has been the subject of sufficient enough of a documentation effort such that a rich, varied collection of audiovisual materials exists as a testament to their cultures and as a source of data for linguists and others. And so, regarding documentation, a classic starting point for those learning about the mo most recent wave of language documentation practice, uh, Nicholas Himmelman describes the process of language documentation as the collection, transcription, and translation of primary data, and the product of language documentation as a lasting multi-purpose record of a language. It is quickly clear that the kind of language documentation work one will undertake is therefore tied to what one considers the data, and ultimately what one considers relevant for language. Both of these concepts are changing, often led by new understandings of language practices and language data from the African continent. In their introduction to this recent volume, uh, African Language Documentation, Saifedinipur and Chambers write that the main line of thought presented in this volume is a broadening of the scope of linguistic investigation and documentation with an ethnographic view, a deeper contextual embedding of linguistic data in a detailed description of language use and its socio-cultural context allows for a better understanding and interpretation of current language ecologies and of the documentary and descriptive data gathered within them. A broader understanding of a larger set of language use patterns, linguistic contexts, and ecologies can in turn feed into our understanding of how languages evolve, shift, and change, and how multilingual patterns arise and may either persevere or decline. 
All of this speaks directly to and finds direct evidence in the trends I can draw from language documentation in the Tanzanian Rift. Returning to our list, I would now like to discuss each of these aspects as well as provide some examples. So let's start at the beginning, that language documentation is strongest when it takes into account the performativeness at the core of communicative practices. And when I talk about performativeness, I would like to evoke the concept of performance as described in Delheim's 1975 Breakthrough into Performance, in which the subject was specifically the stylized folklore genres. Uh, but I find the fit with everyday communication practices quite easy uh, with this description of performance as situated in a context and the performance as emergent as unfolding or arising within that context. Uh, so returning to Saifedinapur and Chambers, one can see how prominent this term context is. And at this point, a comparison is useful. In this case, how two different documentations of two different Rift Valley languages approach the same topic. That is, how do questions work? On the one hand is how I wrote about Gorwa questions in my dissertation. And on the other hand is how Alice Mitchell described the Toga questions in a recent presentation. Uh, this is what I had to say about polar questions in my 2018 sketch grammar, essentially mentioning the form of the particle as well as its place in the sentence. In my own defense, this represents a fairly standard approach in linguistics. Uh, the form has been documented either in a written field note or recorded from elicitation and has been reproduced thus. For Carr and Meek 2013, this is representative of uh, a theoretical tradition that emphasizes the object and subject of language over the process and performance of language, and object and subject being what I assume are the forms of language and the speaker. Compare now Alice Mitchell's description of this example of a question in use, uh, which I will play in full below. Note especially that the example uh, the performance is presented with details about kinship, uh, the physical location, and the speaker's knowledge about the world. In short, its context. In this next example, um, and slightly, so these, these are, this is a five-year-old and a three-year-old. Um, he is the classificatory father of this child, although they don't really know that yet. Um, and, and, this, and this child, the older child's going to ask the younger child a question. And I like this example because it shows how the negotiation of knowledge among even very young children is very sensitive to social relationships, um, specifically those of kinship. So they're digging a hole outside um, this, ch this child's mother's house, okay, which is a bit bad thing to do. Um, there are no adults present except me, so they're you know, taking the opportunity to make a huge mess. Um, dig a great hole in the ground uh, and then the older boy asks um, the younger boy this question <laughs> okay <laughs> so so the first child um, says is Mangangan going to beat us today my daughter so Mangangan is the mother of my daughter it's her house where they're um, digging this hole um, and then my daughter answers, no, everything's fine, okay. <laughs> um, so first of all, you know, this question implies that <clears throat> digging a hole in front of someone's house is a potentially punishable activity. Um, and as such, the older child is displaying an understanding of some kind of moral order. He's imagining how that mother might react to the hole digging. Um, but this question also shows us how the older child is orienting to this three-year-old child's territory of knowledge um, as defined in terms of kin relations and place, right? So the questionable activity is taking place outside the younger child's mother's house, and it's his mother who's likely to be displeased. So having compared these two examples, it, to me it's clear to see which does more service to the communicative function or performative nature of the language. And, you know, the documentary procedure of each is also clearly different. Uh, moving now to the second aspect of language documentation to be discussed, uh, that is, that language documentation has met with general failure when serving agendas of text space, maintenance, and revitalization. Tracing the pedigree of language maintenance and revitalization to its roots with Franz Boas, 
Karin Meek observed that having emerged out of a tradition of salvage ethnography that emphasized text collection, language revitalization itself has largely been about the creation of texts. In the context of the Tanzanian Rift Valley, this is immediately a problem. Though a majority of people are literate, they are literate in Swahili, their other languages are learned, used, and cultivated orally. And as such, developing a documentary project principally in order to produce text-based outputs for maintenance or revitalization has proven essentially futile. Another good example from my past work is this promissory note given to a funding body, which reads, Upon completion of subsequent doctoral studies, Gorwa children will be able to read in their native tongue, and Gorwa traditional knowledge can be stored in books. So, uh, I mean, uncomfortable undertones of white saviorism aside, this turned out to be a misplaced priority for my documentation of Gorwa, one that resulted in not one Gorwa speaker reading, writing, or transferring their oral history to a book for safekeeping. In fact, a similar initiative had actually been going on for almost half a century before my arrival. So since 1977, an Iraq translation of the Old Testament, along with a Gorwa glossary, which helped made it u- make it usable by Gorwa speakers, has been available and relatively widely circulated. And despite Christianity being widely practiced by both speaker communities, most worship still continues in Swahili, while the Iraq Bible, product of decades of work by local translators, remains largely a novelty on people's shelves. Similar Bible translations, storybook publishing, or other religious or secular schemes have driven documentation efforts for at least the languages highlighted here, none of which has seemed to result in widespread adoption, let alone increase in vitality of a given language. The other side of this coin, if you will, seems much more of an interesting prospect. That is, language documentation shows great promise when it seeks to work within and strengthen traditions of orality. This is consistent with Amica 2015, who advocates that Africanists should take advantage of the oral nature of the socio-cultural communities of practice. A recent example of this is Martin Mouse's Iraq Texts in Society project, which has been posting videos of Iraq traditional stories with Swahili subtitles to YouTube. And not only does this remove the barrier of literacy in Iraq to the thousands of speakers who are not, and who probably do not care to be literate in Iraq, but it also represents the stories complete in the context in which they are told. So this one, as women are weaving a grass mat, for example. I would like now to conclude my talk in a similar way to which it started. That is, language documentation, as the discipline responsible for building the lasting records of the languages of the world, has developed primarily as a product of Western academia, with Western conceptions of what counts as linguistic data, as well as what should be included in the description of a language. This dominant concept, however, can no longer be maintained. African language practices and African language data demand new approaches, and offer exciting new visions of how language can be documented. Focusing on a small part of the African continent, rich in linguistic and social diversity, and with a growing history of documentation, I drew several examples showing how language documentation is strongest when it takes into account the performativeness at the core of communicative practices how language documentation has met with general failure when serving agendas of text-based maintenance and revitalization, and how language documentation shows great promise when it seeks to work within and strengthen traditions of orality. The challenge is therefore for language documentarians to put these observations into practice, while at the same time continuing to draw upon what we learn, developing a language documentation in the service of African languages, and the communities that speak them. Thank you, and these are my references.